Good afternoon, good evening, fashion dolls. Oh my God, welcome, welcome to an all new episode of Style Life TV Talk Show. And my very special guest is a Jamaican born Brooklyn beauty. And she's a legend. She is a supermodel. I'm super excited for this interview today with one of my idols. Connie Fleming. She has walked the runways of Mugler and has appeared in books for Isadina Liar and more high fashion designers. I'm super excited. There have been so many to break the mold, but it was something special about her. Like, oh my gosh, she is definitely a trailblazer. And I'm so honored to be doing this interview with her. Like, we're going to get everything set up, fashion dolls. We definitely are. I'm so excited to be doing this interview. Uh, it is a dream come true. It is finally happening. So let's go ahead and get set up so that we can get her in here. And we're going to get this show started, Fashion Dolls. I'm so excited. Uh, so excited to be interviewing this beautiful young lady today. Hey, Nate. Good afternoon and welcome to Style by Stevie Talk Show. Today, we are going to talk about trailblazers. There have been so many trans supermodels out here, like Tracy Norman Africa, who was the first black woman to appear on the color of Clairol, Born Beautiful. She was the first black trans supermodel. And now today, my idol, Connie Fleming, who is a supermodel who has trailblazed and soared on the runways of one of my favorite fashion houses, Mugler. So... Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let's do the honors of welcoming my very special, lovely, beautiful, gorgeous, special guest, Miss Connie Fleming. Hello. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you? Good afternoon. It is an honor to be in your presence, my queen. Uh, I'm doing excellent. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And it's an honor to be uh, um, on your show, on your platform. You're doing such beautiful work. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, I, I bow to you. Like, you are one of my idols. You and Roshamba and so many of these supermodels, Grace Jones, is so many of them out here. And I'm going to start the interview off talking a little bit about colorism because back then I know it was such an issue with diversity with models back in the day. And we've heard so many supermodels like Tyra Banks and Iman and Beverly Johnson and so many of them speak about the issues of diversity in the modeling industry and breaking barriers. And when we talk about trailblazers, we know our girl T.S. Madison has her talk show, has her show on ETV. So breaking barriers everywhere, all the way for our sisters out here in the trans community. And you were one of the few, like it's a list of trans supermodels out here, like Carolyn Cossey. Uh, we've got, what's her name? What's her name? Tracy Norman Africa. We've got Ter Terry Toy. We've got April Ashley. Like the list goes on and on. And now Lena Bloom, you know, who people were I petitioning for her to, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Go, go, go ahead. I was just agreeing, agreeing and, and saying how um, wonderful it is that we're not forgetting the past and we are honoring it and using it as a sort of um, push to push us forward. Because even though, like, you know, certain things were hidden, we were still there and we were still represented and we still have to use that to push us forward. Absolutely, absolutely. And Miss Connie, you are a trailblazer. To look on the runways of Mugler, because I would have been still in diapers when you saw that runway. And I showed my grandmother the footage of you walking for Mugler, for Manfred Terry Mugler. And she was like, this young lady right here has got some sauce. She is sassy. I showed my grandmother now and my mom, and they love you. They love you so Thanks. much. You are truly the trailblazer. Thank you. And it was um, frightening and really um, incredibly lucky that I um, came up at a time where creators really looked at um, talent and really wanted to celebrate that. 
and like, you know, the downtown artistic community, the club, nightclub music, and fashion community really um, wanted to push their own. And that was always instilled in me as a creative person. So, um, like, I felt lucky, but I felt that I had a, um, a duty to do a duty to my community, a duty as a, as a person of color um, to do my best and to push the door open as far as I could get it because there are going to be those that are going to be coming after me and we have to open those spaces and give people who are coming behind us a way to move forward and to expand. Absolutely. And you've had an excellent catalog of work in the fashion industry from working with my fave, uh, one of my favorite fashion designers, Terry Glare. And you're also in his book as well. I had to mark the page. I said, that's her. Oh, my God. And the iconic outfit that everyone is still talking about. I don't know if you guys can see it on page 107 right here in the right hand corner. That is Miss Connie Fleming strutting down the runway. And it's on another page as well, too, that I found in here. Like the photography is absolutely breathtaking. And Stephen Mizell got you into this industry and opened the door for so many models out here. No, uh, to work with um, Mugler was a fantasy. Um, like uh, my first season, he was like, oh, we have to shoot together. And I was like, oh, okay. But like, you know, you don't, you, you don't want to be um, pushy or, you know, what, whatever. You just wait for it to come. And um, I was working at the legendary Patricia Field on A Street. And oh. um, mm -hmm. Alex Malka called me up and said, um, what are you doing next week? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? What am I doing next week? And he's like, oh, Mugler will be in town and we want to shoot. So um, I said, well, yeah, you know, of course. So um, it was, I think, either um, it was close to the Empire State Building. So I was like, wait a minute, am I going to be on an eagle? Like that, uh, like, like from the, uh, the vampire collection, where I think it's Dauphine on the eagle um, of the yes. April. And I'm like, is this what we're going to be doing? And it's like, I'm up for it. Um, but uh, it was close to the Empire State Building and on a roof. And we shot a couple of pictures. And he wasn't satisfied. So he's like, oh, we're going to the desert. Will you be available? And I was, again, yes. And we went to uh, the desert of New Mexico, um, White Sands. And it was such an incredible experience seeing his mind work and to see like, um, it's, it's sort of like maybe Japanese print, how the figure and then the wide expanse of nature that is so beautiful and such an iconic part of his photography. And um, we shot in the desert for like a week and it was just incredible. And uh, before that, um, when I first met Stephen Mizell, it was um, at the, again, legendary Patricia Field Ball. Um, and he was one of the judges. And um, a couple of months later, um, the great Jimmy Paul, um, great hairstylist, incredibly talented, beautiful yes. um, Jimmy Paul, um, called me up and said, Stephen wants to meet with you. So I went to the studio um, and um, he was shooting oh, wow. Dean Elias' book. And it was just incredible. 
an incredible experience. And I had, like, you know, grown up seeing those photos of Stephen and Terry Toy when they got married at the limelight, all of his, like, incredible work. And, like, I think I was in a bit of a haze and, like, didn't want my mind to take over and my nerves to take over. So I just... Um, cleared my mind and I went in and I did my best and it was just so incredible to be in Alaya and like I remember there's that one shot with the ponytail um, uh, Orbe has one knee and Francois Nars has the other knee and they're shaking me and that's how that photo came about and it was just like oh my god like the creative spirit and the creative um, a world and making these images. Um, it was just so wonderful to be a part of that and to not be just um, like, you know, a still life, uh, a vase of flowers. Um, it was about the back and forth and about the... Um, everybody putting in to make this image happen. Yes, and not only Mugler and Isadina Laya, but Vivian Westwood as well, too. You mentioned Patricia Fields. I remember, because you guys know that I love Sarah Jessica Parker. I love Sex in the City, and I'm channeling my inner Carrie Bradshaw today. But that's one of the um, stores that she was at during the shoot of the show. Like, Patricia Fields is a very well-known designer, and I love her designs as well, too. Extremely fabulous. But Mugler, like you just mentioned, Miss Fleming, was on a whole nother level. Like, I can't describe his designs. Like, it is so out of this world. And I remember seeing Christy Turlington, Linda Evangelista, and so many others in his music video for, what was it, George Michael, Too Funky. And I remember seeing you on the runway as well, Too Strut Down in the Red Ensemble. And I said, that's her. Oh, my God. I'm going to have her on the show. And it's just so surreal to see my idol, like the woman who has paved the way for people like myself and other trans Black women like the Laverne Cox. I've seen someone mention her in the audience. And there was a great documentary that is out called Disclosure that is given the history on our trans idols and mentors, the women who have paved the way out here for us. So it's always great to go back and look back at the ones who have, that were before you, like the Tracy Norman Africas, who was the first African-American woman to appear on the Clairol Born Beautiful box. And back then, like Ms. Fleming just mentioned, because I've seen so much about it, it was very hard because once you got outed, like you never worked in the industry again. And I was watching in the interview with Miss um, Tracy Norman Africa that she opened up about that. Like it was so oh, challenging wow. back then for models who were transgender. And it still kind of is today for not just models who are transgender, but I don't know if you guys know, I hate bringing up her name, Angela Stanton King. Mm -hmm. uh, her daughter came out as trans. And I know you've seen it, Miss Fleming. Mean, my heart cringed seeing what this baby is going through yeah. with coming out and living their truth and being their authentic self and not having the support system from their mom who you would have thought would have always been there like it's very difficult so what advice would you give to people who are struggling to come out you know as trans or just come out in general or and be safe and comfortable within their own skin um my advice would be to Strengthen yourself because um, there is the thing of mirroring when you speak to someone. You don't speak to a female the way you speak to a male. And yes. um, you have to know you are confronting someone and their sort of view of themselves and their view of society. So you have to strengthen yourself and know that... Um, you are going to come up against it and um, you cannot internalize it even though it's super difficult but you cannot internalize it you cannot let it um, weaken your resolve because as you go along 
all of these things that are coming at you are lessons. Lessons mm -hmm. you need to know as a uh, person of color, as a minority, as a um, someone who is perceived as different. And these lessons teach you about people and about what their motives are and what they are truly capable of. Because no one has to hide their true face from us. And we have to take this as a huge blessing because it, for me, it has saved me from so much of the bullshit in life. And I have to look back and be super, super thankful that, you know, I wasn't kind of taken advantage of or um, misled in any way. So, you know, these kind of obstacles, we really have to take them blessings and uh, we have to let it inform us um, because our journey is important. It's important to society. It's important to tradition. And we have to, you know, it is, it is hard, but we have to gird our loins and keep on going because um, we have to make uh, these changes for the better of society. And, you know, sometimes we, not, we, we might not see the full um, blossoming of this, but as long as you're in there and you are working and you are pushing, um, you're in the game and you're not like sort of outside of it. Um, you're not outside looking in. You are there. You are like, you know, pushing the door open, um, educating, um, facilitating, making this change real. Because sometimes you have to remember, like, you know, sometimes you're the only person that you are, that this, that whomever you come up uh, to meet with or are, you know, in the same spaces with, you are the only one of your kind that they've ever come in contact with. So you also have to have that in mind and to have the compassion, not to be stepped on, but the compassion in order to be stronger than them and not to fall into the sort of framework of being ignorant and pushing the ignorance. So that's kind of my, my, my advice, my advice. long-winded and a little convoluted, but I think, um, I, I think, you know, we have to um, know who we are and know that um, we are valuable. And it's not um, frivolous or we're not trying to fool or trying to get over because who would, who, who would choose this way to get over? There is no way to get over in, in life, period. Absolutely, 100%. And we got some questions from some of the audience. Um, Arsenic Apricot wants to know, did you ever get the feeling like the odds were stacked up against you and how do you remain so positive? Um, yes, I, I, I do have that feeling every, every now and then, but that's life. You know, um, I have health, I have my family, my mom, um, I have um, like a community that is behind me and pushes me. So I have a lot of blessings and I don't want to put the blessings on the back burner 
and not recognize what these blessings are bringing us. We can't, we, we, we can't be clouded by the negativity because the negativity is there to hold you and for you not to sort of say and reach out for the blessings. So, you know, you, you have to keep your eye open and your eye on the prize and not let the negativity be a veil over, uh, over this because you don't want to miss what is there for you. You don't want to miss um, an opportunity. You don't want to miss kind of um, the blessings that have been laid out for you. And Lord knows that it's been so many blessings. Like, this is a dream come true to finally meet my idol. Like, back in the day, because I was still a baby at that time, and then as I got, like, in high school, my assistant principal, shout out to her, she put me on to Vogue magazine, and I thought the designers was just Gucci, and that was just it. But I said, she told me, no, she said, no, ma'am, baby, uh-uh. It's so much more than that. It's Mugler, it's Chanel, it's Fendi, it's Prada, it's Gian Battista Valley, it's Hermes. It's so many fashion houses out here. But how I came across you and learning about supermodels was she also taught me that as well, too. It's more than just Tyra and Naomi and uh, the Cindy Crawfords and the Lindy Evangelistas. But to flip, to flip through the pages of a magazine like British Vogue and Vogue UK, Miss Fleming, you just don't know how much an honor it is to see a woman that looks like me. And I've said we were gonna talk a little bit about colorism because you are your this beautiful, gorgeous chocolate goddess. And I said, she looks just like me. She has my lips. She has my skin complexion. I don't feel left out because when Black women look at images, it's triggering for some of us because we figure, are we going to look like that? All of us supposed to look like that? And it's the complete opposite. Like God has created all Black women in all shades and forms. And we've seen so many supermodels from Naomi to actresses like Viola Davis to uh, to Raji P. Henson, to Gabrielle Union, speak out on colorism. And I'm pretty sure you've had your challenges too with that, Miss Fleming, being this beautiful African-American woman in the industry and being told no. And I've heard Tyra and Naomi even speak out about it as well and say, you know, I've been told no because of the color of my skin. Yeah. No, definitely. It, it, it is part of the excuse to sort of not have to deal with you. Um, and it is an excuse and it is a cop out. And you cannot like let that into your soul. Because I, I, I mean, I grew up with Grace Jones, um, Katushka, Munya, Imalia, all of these beautiful chocolate women that were the muses of Saint Laurent, Givenchy, all of the great designers of like the 70s, 80s, 60s, um, and even going back to Daniela Luna, who was lighter skinned. Yes. Still a hue. There was still a richness. There was still a, um, a, a, a sauce in there, seasoning. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't um, like the blonde blue eyed because even yes. get tired of the blonde and blue eyed and then they go to Brazil or China or Africa. And you kind of also have to look at it as uh, the, uh, the revolving of fashion and the sort of, you know, today we go to um, Hong Kong, tomorrow it's New York, you know, the week after it's Paris. And there are sort of um, these ebbs and flows, um, but it's hard to be a person to withstand those ebbs and flows. And you have to really seek out who sees you and doesn't want to use an excuse to negate you and to pass you over. Because ultimately it's them, it's not you. 
And you always have to kind of try and keep that in the back of your mind that, you know, my worth can't be defined by this person who yes. has superior motive. Um, because that or uh, ulterior motive disguises so many things about themselves and it has nothing to do with you. So, you know, it, it, it's again, not um, taking the blinders off and not letting the negativity, um, you know, blind you. But, you know, there, there, there were, um, people that were like, oh, how do we shoot you? Oh, we don't have your color of foundation. It's like, you know, what one of the first lessons I learned was to bring your own foundation. Because it, it, it's like, you know, it was um, backstage, um, I think at Mugler, my, my first season and someone, I think it was Karen Alexander the gorgeous Karen uh, Alexander. Cover girl. Mm -hmm. She was like, um, girl, you don't have your foundation? And I was like, no. And she's like, is it in your bag? And I was like, I think so. She's like, go and get it now. And I went and luckily it was in there. And she was like, because she's like, look across the way. And it was this girl and they were putting sand on a girl that was like maybe two to three shades lighter than me. And she's like, always bring it with you. Because it's like, you know, um, it's um, it was that thing of we don't have to cater to you. Even though you were hired, you were, you are there. So what do you mean you're kind of catering to me? It is your job. Your tools are part of your job. And why am I forgotten? So, you know, in order not to be forgotten, you had to, you know, have a brush, your own foundation, your own stockings, your own thong in your color. Because that, 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 was, that was another thing. When I started to do um, casting and uh, show production, it was like, you know, the person, um, the assistant would go out to go get thongs. And I was like, okay, yes, get the white girl, but get for me, for someone like me and for someone two shades lighter than me. It's there in the store. I know it. So, you know, it, 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 it does take like what they're saying now about this, you know, this new BLM movement with yes. businesses and companies um, to have a representative there to say, think of this. You know, the world doesn't encompass your sort of world and that's where it ends. Um, so, you know, there, there, there does, um, we do need repre re representation in the boardrooms and in the casting and in the production of things, because there will be things that fall by the wayside. But if there is someone there that knows, they can clue you in and make sure that all are able to be represented. Absolutely, 100%. And when it comes to just the beauty industry and the cosmetic industry and stuff, I thank God for people like Brianna, who has started her collection, you know, her makeup line with 50 foundation shades. And then you've got other brands like Makeup Forever and um, the most controversial college, and all of them are trying to follow in her footsteps. But it's amazing to see how the beauty industry has definitely changed when it comes to makeup. And there's another supermodel that you said that does her own makeup as well, too. Um, I think it was Tyra. She said this, like a model by the name of Yasmin. She was on the cover of Cosmopolitan. Everybody's seen it. It's the pink dress. Um, she would literally be on the floor, not exaggerating, doing her makeup. Like, 
finding your perfect lighting and all of these things. Back in the day, this is what models would have to do. Even Beverly Peel spoke out about it and said, you know, I would have to bring my own foundation shade as well, too. Or you would be in the dust and left to the sort of imaginings of somebody that wanted to mix something pink and something red and go, oh, you're good. And you turn around and you look at yourself and you're like, oh, brick face and stucco. How wonderful <laughs> for me. So, you know, yeah, um, once you get in, you have to see the lessons and you have to be your own best advocate and make a way for yourself. Because, you know, if, if you kind of know that that excuse that you are to be forgotten is there, don't take it on and don't internalize it. Make sure you bring your tools so that you won't be sort of, you know, put to the wayside. But it's like there were other makeup artists of all colors that were, that knew and that saw us being upset and did go out and did do the work. And even um, before Rihanna, there was Iman. Iman oh, yes. opened up with the foundations and with the sort of hues of color and the sort of um, box of Western beauty standards that can't be sort of met and aren't really met because there's retouching even before the internet. There's lighting, there's this, there's that. So, you know, you have to, again, be your, 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 uh, your best advocate and know that, you know, you have to, you bear a responsibility also to not be passed over and, and to be seen and to be um, present within your representation. Even when it came to doing models hair, you would hear certain models speak out and say, you know, you've got a model with 4C hair. And I would look and it would make me furious to see that they barely did anything to the model's hair. And it's just like, why you do the white models hair a little bit better, but the black models that have the about this texture hair, 4C texture hair, you would just leave it like undone. Yeah. Like that's yeah. not not even a brush. Not even a brush through, not even a little bit of like moisturizer, nothing. And you're like backstage and you're looking at them and they're like, Oh, the blonde girl behind you, let me go because they know that they know they are passing you over and they don't want to be thought of as being um, unaware, uncaring. And it's like, you know, you, you also have to not sort of make waves and go, what about me? And, you know, you have to kind of, as uh, like with the foundation, you have to bring your own brush, you have to bring your own moisturizer. And like, you know, a lot of times, like the makeup artists and the hair people would finish with you. And like five minutes later, everybody's in the bathroom going over it and pushing it and making it better. And then they're taking credit for it. Not all, but you know, there, there are times when you had to go and do it for yourself or go out there looking like, oh, um, did you get there late? I mean, you know, and, and, and then you're supposed to kind of make an excuse for them because th there was one show where they put perm in my hair and I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, uh, it needs to come out and they're like, okay. And they're like, oh, is there a sink? And it's like, excuse me? So I'm running around the venue looking for a sink to wash it out. So it's that kind of thing that like, you know, you kind of have to go, oh, okay. It is part, this is part of my 
responsibility and my job. So I have to make sure that I am prepared because it's not always going to be laid out for me. And like, you know, you don't, um, because now there are the girls that are speaking out, but back then, me, you know, you spoke out and then, you know, okay, see you whenever. You know, it was, they, they, they could erase you. And like, you know, well, I, I did get labeled. At the end, I got labeled as being difficult and uncooperative because I wasn't going along with the narrative that they wanted to put on me. And I wanted to say, no, I'm trans and no, this. And I got labeled difficult. And nobody wants to work with somebody that's quote unquote difficult because, you know, you're uncooperative, you don't want to do this, you don't want to do that. But, you know, sometimes you have to make the, the charge and let the cards fall where they may. I made that face, Miss Flynn. I know she's like, girl, why did you do that? I made that face because I've been speaking about that all week long. That is the attitude that has been given to women from even in politics, Maxine Waters to Ayanna Presley to any Black woman that speaks up about anything. We're labeled as aggressive or difficult or bitter. And I've gave several examples of black women who have spoken out and said this isn't right if you know this is racism this is not right and just recently on the talk with sharon osborne you've got cheryl underwood she said i didn't want to say anything because i didn't want to look like the bitter or angry black woman that is the attitude that has been given to black women for years even to the actresses out here who spoke mm -hmm. out about you know things that they noticed that were not right monique and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, um, Janet Hubert. Yes. Like, that is the attitude that has been given to Black women if we speak out on something, even to the most, uh, how can I say, it? woke, Amanda Seals. Amanda Seals, she said, well, you know, if I speak out or if I say something, you know, or I say, hello, this isn't right, I'm going to be labeled as difficult or yeah. aggressive. When in actuality, who has more reason on this earth to be angry, to feel that I have to voice something that is wrong, voice something that is horrifying and um, debilitating and making the world a horrifying place? Um, you know, it, it, it is it is a way to neutralize and to um, enable the sort of narrative that all is good and to put it on you and to make you sort of the, um, the holder of the racism. And now that you're holding it, you're responsible for it. It is putting the responsibility off on other to take it off of yourself because nobody wants to be seen as 